Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to episode 6 of The Killer Tea, where we'll be talking about the giggling granny, Nanny Nandos. We are your hosts, Christina and Chelsea, and we will be the purveyors of bullshit for the next 60 minutes. Welcome to your life for the next hour. More death and murder. Murder. This time, it's lady killers. Yes, bitch. Nanny Doss, man. What a... Okay, I, I love that our first female killer is a fucking, like, grandma, like, killing people. Yeah, have you have you looked at the pictures of her? Yeah, she looks like she, uh, my grandma. She, she looks, looks like a sweet grandma. Yeah, she looks like just a total normal grandma type figure. In every picture, she's just smiling nicely and just, like... Has her string of pearls. It's fun. And her pin curls and her cute little 1950s looking outfits. Like, like this bitch. Yeah. She was, uh. She's not nice. She was into some shit. She was not nice to, like, fucking anybody. No, nobody was safe around her. No. Nobody was safe. Literally, not any of her family members were safe. That's the most, I think, jacked up part is it's literally all of her family. Yeah. So, trigger warning, while today isn't going to be super intense or descriptive, it is going to do a little bit with infant and children death. Yeah. So, just a slight trigger warning for those of you who might be sensitive to those sort of things. Otherwise, what is unusual, or not not even unusual, what is typical of female killers is they don't tend to be very messy. So, for once, we're not going to have a super gory episode. Yay, no gore. <laughs> what a break. And no necrophilia. And Yay. no, no necro, not even kinda, not even sorta. Not even a smidgen. For once <laughs> in five, six fucking episodes, <laughs> nobody is having sex with dead bodies. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Or getting off on dead bodies. Yeah. Oh, my God. You you know, I never thought that my goals would include not talking about necrophilia. It's a goal. It's a goal. It's a real goal, guys. It's a thing. Well, I guess uh, we should kick this shit off. Um, Chelsea. Do you want to set the scene? Yeah, I'll set the scene. Talk murder to me, baby. All right. So on the outside, Nancy Doss, Nanny Doss, seemed like a sweet little old lady. She smiled and she she laughed all the time. She was well liked in her community. Nobody really had anything bad to say about her. She was married. She cared for her children and her grandchildren, and she just seemed like your happy little old lady. But she was not. No, she was not. No. So, should we start at the very beginning? Yes, we should. As soon as I silence my cell phone. Hey, get on your shit today. <laughs> what the fuck? What are you doing? So, Nanny Doss uh, left a trail of death behind her from the 1920s until 1954. One um, girl took her time. She confessed to killing four out of five of her husbands. And the police pretty much believe that she killed a lot more, but she never confessed to those murders, but we'll talk about them anyway, because yeah. it's pretty solid that she also killed at least six other people. <laughs> I just yeah. did the math real quick in my head. I'm like, four. Nope. Six. Holy crap. <laughs> so we'll start all the way at the beginning with 
you know. Yeah. Nanny being born. So Nanny was born on November 4th, 1905 in Blue Mountain, Alabama. 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 And she was born to Nancy. Oh, no. She was born as Nancy Hazel. Yeah, that's Nanny that's her short name. for... Nanny is short for Nancy. Which is like the same name length. What the fuck? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but her mom was Louisa, and her father was James. And Nanny was one of five children, and I believe she was the oldest. And her nickname came because she was, you know, a big caregiver for her younger siblings. <laughs> Ironic! <laughs> Irony! Yeah, she had one brother and three sisters, and... Collectively, the entire family hated their father. He was an asshole. He was controlling and he was verbally abusive. Um, he actually, the kids ended up being pretty poorly educated because James forced them to miss school in order to do farm work and farming. Um, well, I mean, I think that's a sign of the times too. They were, um, the family was in poverty. And so they needed the kids to work on the farm. They couldn't afford to have help. Yeah. So, but ultimately, um, I think Nanny only finished the sixth grade. She made it to seventh grade. And that's when she finally had to drop out of school because she was helping her family at the farm full time. So at the age of seven, while the whole family was taking a train to visit some some family in southern Alabama... Uh, Nanny actually hit her head on a metal bar um, and believes that she suffered um, a serious TBI, possibly. Possibly. A brain injury from this incident because it resulted in, in migraines and headaches and even blackouts and supposedly depression. Yeah, I mean, it's important to note that she didn't just like fall out of her seat, but the train stopped very suddenly. And so it very violently threw her forward and yeah. hit her head on this metal bar. And she suffered with a lot of problems because of that. And in those times, I mean, if you hit your head, you hit your head. Yeah. They didn't realize the kind of severity of what yeah. brain but trauma did. the fact did. that she was suffering from severe headaches and blacking out and bouts of depression. It, sound, it does sound it like does TBI. It does sound like she had a traumatic brain injury. Uh, but she would go on later in life to blame her mental instability on that particular incident. So Yeah, we can talk about the psychology on that a little bit more later, but that is a very interesting kind of segue because we do know that head trauma can cause massive... And especially at seven years old, where your brain is already... It's a very crucial time for its development. Oh, yeah. I mean... Having a major brain injury like that can go as far as even changing your entire personality. Yeah, so, I mean, it could play a role in it. Who knows? Uh, But throughout her childhood, one of her favorite hobbies that kind of imprinted on her entire life moving forward was reading her mom's romance novels and the romance magazine. And she kind of drew, dreamt up her own alternate reality of of meeting prince charming and falling madly in love and i mean she would go as far as to read the lonely hearts column which was a big thing back in the day (laughs) (laughs) and she would dream of these just wonderful romantic men coming to the farm and rescuing her and taking her away to you know get away from her oppressive family yeah there was a lot of speculation that as books are anyways regardless if their their romance or not are kind of an escape oh absolutely i mean i think she really used that as a way to escape the abuse that she was suffering undergoing i think to talk about more about the abuse is nanny's father was very strict with his girls the girls were not allowed to wear makeup or attractive clothing dresses were a nope and he did this because he wanted to not have them be raped or molested by men However, it happened. It happened anyways. anyways. On several occasions, um, Nanny was actually molested by men who were at the farm or worked at the farm. Yeah, this happened a number of times. We don't have too many details about it, but it was a string of men and more than once. Yes, and when she did come forward to talk to her family about what was happening, they just straight were like, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. No, it's not. Well... Very shortly after 
uh, some of this stuff had happened, maybe in just a few years, she was 16 years old and fell into her first marriage. Well, she met her first husband at her first job, which was working at a linen factory. And that is where she met Charles Bragg. She actually didn't get to have most, barely any social inter interaction with other people based on how strict her father was and all these rules. So this first job was like her first attempt at real socialization with anybody and else. Her and Charles had only been dating for four months. Her and Charles had only been dating for four months. That is definitely not enough time to really get to know someone. No, not at all. It's and especially if that's your first relationship and you're only 16. Yeah. Lord. So when other kids were attending school and worrying about prom night, Doss was working in this linen factory, spending all of her spare time with her head buried in a book, reading romance magazines in the Lonely Heart section, and then she meets this man that will, this boy that will become her husband. She isn't, um, in my opinion, developmentally ready for marriage well, I and mean, a baby. You got to think at this point, it's 1921. Yeah. I mean, so I guess it is, true. it is definitely a different time and a different way of doing things. But I think it's important to note that Charlie Bragg was the son of a single mother who insisted on continuing to live with him even after he was married. And the only reason that Nanny was kind of forced into marrying this guy is because her father was so worried that she would have sexual relationships with him and end up getting <laughs> pregnant out of wedlock. Oh my god. Oh, the world ending. Who could imagine such a terrible thing? Well, it was 1921. I know. That was basically the end of the world. But it's just, it's just fucking crazy to me that, like, parents would actually thrust their children into marriages because, God forbid, they have sex. It's just, uh, what a world. Oh, times. So, Nanny later wrote in some of her letters that, I was married, as my father wished, in 1921 to a boy I only knowed about four or five months who had no family, only a mother who was unwed and who had taken over my life completely when we were married. She'd never seen anything wrong with what she'd done, and she would take spells. She would not let my own mother even stay all night. One super controlling situation into another. Yes, Nanny really kind of fell into a crap situation here because not only did she get out from under her controlling father's thumb, but she fell right back under her controlling mother-in-law's thumb, who basically just didn't think that Nanny could do anything right, didn't think she was good enough for her son. Just and her son never defended, her husband no, never defended her or stood up for her. never defended her. So Nanny turns to drinking, smoking, and kind of develops a pretty nasty habit. Um, and But this marriage did produce four daughters. Yeah, it lasted eight years. There was also some infidelity issues on both yeah, ends. Yeah, Charles was known to cheat on his wife, and the stressed out nanny would also sometimes cheat on him. Cheat on so. her husband too. So you know yeah, things were, were going great. Mutual infidelity there. So what, what can you do? Um, but Braggs would go on to say to say that she had a vicious streak when she would get upset, um, and he described her as being high tempered and mean and there's even a quote that i found where he says when she got mad i wouldn't eat anything she fixed or drink anything around the house yeah charles right from the get-go was skeptical of his wife and was actually quoted as saying that he was a little bit scared of her and thought that he that she, and he thought that she would eventually kill him. Yeah, so it was his opinion that the only thing that kept him alive was the fact that he didn't have a life insurance policy. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> so at this point, um, this kind of leads us into where things really start to spiral. If you can believe it, things are about to get worse, folks. Before the relationship with Braggs could end, one of their children died very shortly after birth. And then another two died when they were very young. The in 1927, the couple lost lost quote unquote their two middle girls to suspected food poisoning. Yeah, Charles arrived home and found the two middle girls lying on the kitchen floor, writhing in agony. And Nan Nanny told him that she thought it was food poisoning, and the girls ended up dying. Yeah, there's a. Uh, 
No evidence to confirm that she did kill her children, but what what a coincidence. What yeah, a coincidence. It was very suspicious circumstances, and shortly after this, Charles actually took their oldest daughter, Malvina. And left that shit. And left. <laughs> he was like, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, he left um, Nanny with Florine, their youngest little girl, their youngest baby, and just took the oldest one and was like... Bye. Bye. You're not killing me next, bitch. <laughs> so Bregs and Nanny divorced soon after, um, and she took her remaining children back to her mother's home. And Bragg's always maintained that he left her because he was terrified that he, she was going to kill him. Oh, yeah, definitely. And there's a theory that I was reading into where people suspected that Nanny killed her children as a way to get revenge on Charles for his infidelities. Yeah. Yes. That because she couldn't hurt him by having her own affairs, the easiest way to hurt him would be to kill two of his children. I kind of got the feeling that she didn't want kids. She didn't want the burden of children. I don't know if she didn't want the burden of children. I think she wanted think, her first daughter and not the other three. I think she was just very, very stressed out. Mm. I think she was very stressed out and was being controlled by her mother-in-law with a husband that wasn't faithful and wasn't holding up his end of the bargain. And I think she was just deeply unsatisfied with her life. And I honestly think it makes more sense that she killed the kids out of revenge mm. than anything else. Well, we very shortly move on to her second husband, Robert Harrelson. They met and married in 1929, so if they, I, th I think she divorced her previous husband in 1927 or 1928, so it did not take long for this girl to get to meet somebody else no. and get married. And I think it's funny to note that she found the second husband in the Lonely Hearts column. Yeah, weird. Yeah. He was writing, she responded to his, like, Lonely Hearts ad, and she responded, and they would write romantic letters. And she would write racy letters and then send even send photos, photos. which oh. is ooh pearl clutch my goodness but once uh, she moved to jacksonville to be with him with her two daughters malvina and florine she uh, quickly discovered that he was an alcoholic and had a criminal record for assault and she married him anyway yeah and that marriage actually lasted 16 years so for somebody who was like oh my god i can't believe that you're all of these things you just don't accidentally fall into a marriage for 16 years no and i think she really like if you look at the um economics and how things were back in that time i don't think women had a lot of job opportunities mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was much easier to be married to an alcoholic man who could provide for her than to try to find work that would support her and her two daughters. So Melvina is Nanny's daughter. Her oldest daughter. Her oldest daughter. Melvina gave birth to Robert Lee Haynes. <laughs> like Robert Lee. <laughs> like <laughs> you want to talk mm. about a daughter of Dixie. <laughs> well I mean <laughs> We're very southern here. <laughs> southern you know, Alabama was Alabama. naming our kids Robert Lee. And now they're in Jacksonville. So, <laughs> so he, he was born in 1943. Another baby followed two years later, but died soon afterward. And Melvina, who was exhausted from labor and, and childbirth, thought she saw her visiting mother stick a hat pin into the baby's head. When she asked her husband and the sister for clarification, they said that Nanny had told them the baby was dead, and they also had noticed she was holding a pin. Yeah, it's important to note that Malvina's labor with Robert Lee was rough. Or no, not with Robert Lee. Oh my God. It's important to note that Malvina's labor with the new baby had been super rough and she'd been giving ether. So she really thought that she was kind of like hallucinating. Nope, mom's just a fucking horrible no, person. mom's just a horrible fucking person. So Doss likely killed her newborn granddaughter by <laughs> stabbing her in the brain. Um, but the doctors couldn't really give a positive explanation for why the baby would die. When, when the baby was perfectly fine when the doctors were in the room. Uh, it was after they left mm -hmm. that nanny 
is suspected of killing her grandbaby. So not only did this woman kill her grandchild and her daughter's child, but because of that death, it actually drove a wedge between Melvina and her husband. So it resulted in Melvina essentially having an affair with a soldier that, of course, Nanny did not approve of. Of course she didn't. And this actually caused Nanny and Melvina to have a really nasty fight. And Melvina actually decided to take a break go and visit go father. visit her father and, and leave her son Robert. Well, she thought she could leave her son Robert in her mother's care. Which well, turns out to be a really bad idea. Robert, <laughs> unfortunately, on July 7th of 1945, died very suddenly and mysteriously. And his death was ruled as asphyxia from unknown causes which can actually be attributed to many different types of death. It could be considered SIDS in a baby. It could be accidental drowning or, you know, like being smothered with a like a pillow Whoa. or... What a coincidence you know, that Nanny had like that. also taken out a life insurance policy on little Robert. Yeah, she had taken out an uh, insurance policy. For $500. She killed her grandson for $500. Even adjusted for inflation, that's still not a huge that's, payout. No, I think if I remember correctly, it w- it would have been like seven grand. Yeah, which is really not nothing. A huge life insurance policy, but so in 1945, Japan surrendered um, to the and, Allied powers at the end of World War II. Yes, and, and Harrelson was a, um, among the most robust partiers. Yeah, yeah they, her husband went out and was like partying with all the soldiers and all the people because World War II had ended. It was a big deal. Yeah, everyone was out having a good time, but he was heavily drinking, which remember, he's an alcoholic, so if he was heavily drinking, he must have been like drinking. And according to Nanny, he allegedly raped her. Yeah, and this was kind of like the final straw for her. And the next day, she discovered his corn whiskey jar buried in the ground when she was in her rose garden. And she just decided, you know what? I'm done. So she topped the jar off with rat poison. And then her husband died that evening. Most people assume that it was food poisoning. Yeah, a lot of the doctors were just assuming that because he was a heavy alcoholic, he had just contact contracted some sort of virus and his body just couldn't handle it and he died and i imagine that some people are wondering like how does this woman get surrounded by so many people that die of food poisoning because that's usually what everyone was assuming was happening back in the day sanitation and all of that stuff wasn't wasn't great no but what's interesting to me is that harrelson knew something was off with his wife and at his grandson's funeral, actually told family members, I'll be next. She's going to mm-hmm. kill me next. Yeah. So it wasn't for many, many years that Nanny would even admit to ending the marriage via rat poison. <laughs> yeah. But she actually had a life insurance policy out on him as well. And mm-hmm. she collected enough money that she bought a pot- plot of land and put a house on it in Jacksonville. Well, when she admitted to poisoning her husband... She said that there was a chance her grandson may have gotten a hold of some of that rat poisoning. Okay. As you do. Sure. As you fucking do. (sighs) Uh, So that takes us into the third husband. husband number three, Arlie Lanning. Nanny met her third husband, Arlie, through another Lonely Hearts column while in Lexington, North Carolina. Ooh, hometown. So she married him three days later. (laughs) She met him and then she married him. And like her previous husband, Lanny was an alcoholic. An alcoholic and a womanizer. Yay, infidelity and booze. But in this marriage, it was Nanny who often disappeared and. For months on end. Up to months on end. But when she was home, she played the doting housewife. And, And I didn't read if, like, she was also having affairs, but since she's the kind of person that had affairs in her previous marriages, I would assume that maybe that was Yeah, from one of the other podcasts when I was researching her, it was said that she was off having affairs. Mm -hmm. She was pretty pissed that he was another alcoholic womanizer and she would basically like be damned if she was gonna be home when he was around, you Um, know, to be abused more. And so she basically just avoided him as much as she could. 
but he died <laughs> of apparent heart failure and the townspeople actually supported her at his funeral and just were like this poor woman like what is happening she- and i think it's important to note here that she has moved with mm-hmm. each death and each murder she has committed she has then picked up and moved her life and this is the 1920s so it's not like police records you know yeah. followed you wherever you and went they didn't really even communicate that well back in the day so. no almost not at all So she would later say, you know, after she's confessing to these things, that he was running around with another woman, and that was, you know, her reason behind killing him. But also, just before Lanning had died, his nephew that was living with the both of them also passed away from food poisoning. How utterly convenient. (sighs) It just... It blows my mind that, like, well, I guess you're right. She had been moving around, so people probably didn't know any better and didn't know her family history. No, they didn't know anything about her. But what's also ironic is after her husband mysteriously dies of heart failure, the the house house burns to the fucking ground. That was supposed to be left to his sister, not to Nanny. His sister was supposed to get the house, so that bitch burned down, and then the insurance money went to Nanny. Mm Mm-hmm. And in 1953, Nanny, using the tried-and-true stewed prune recipe, murdered Lanning's elderly mother, with whom was living with her. So the house burns down. And her husband, her late husband, who she's just killed, his mother is elderly and is like, you know, I feel so bad for you. I want to take you in. You poor dear. You've suffered. Bitch kills his mama. Like... Then she kills his mom, and his mom ended up dying in her sleep, but we know she killed killed her. Mm -hmm. And then she picks up and moves North Carolina and goes back to her sister's home. Her sister's home. Key key word here. Her Her sister. sister. Her blood. (laughs) And her sister had recently been diagnosed with cancer, and she really wasn't doing well. She was bedridden and really needed someone to take care of her. And Nanny is like, this is the perfect goddamn situation. And soon after Nanny's arrival, her sister fucking died. Her sister died. Yeah. Dead. We, there's, a, there's a pattern. There's a pattern here, guys. Here. Very interesting to, pattern. We're up to two husbands, a mother-in-law, two, her sister. Three children. Two of her children. A nephew. A nephew and two grandchildren. No, three of her children because she had another baby that died. Yeah, but there's no proof that she killed that baby. Yeah, there's no proof that she killed her children either. Well, yeah. So, I don't know. There's just a trail of death. Trail of bodies. Just a trail of death. So that leads us into husband number four. Richard Morton. So Nanny joined yet another dating service called the Diamond Circle Club. Ooh, that sounds so fancy. And soon met Richard L. Morton of Jamestown, North Carolina. Morton (laughs) lasted just four months into their marriage before he was on the wrong side of the soil. Oh, my God. (laughs) She has just, like, ramped it up. Can we just appreciate that it took her, like, what was 20 something years to make her first couple kills and then she's just like you know what one right after the other let's just knock these out let's just get this done that insurance money though so morton didn't have a drinking problem but he did cheat on annie a lot and (laughs) Annie didn't really discover that at first though because her mom comes in she was too distracted so her mother comes to stay with them right and yeah, her mom had fall, fallen and broke her hip and needed a caretaker. So, oh, of course, yeah. Nanny, the, the caretaker. The caretaker, come the, and stay with me. The and then maternal Nanny. She <laughs> kills her she fucking mother. kills her mom. She kills her fucking mom. She kills her fucking mom. Yep. What? And then one of her other sisters dies suddenly after having contact with Nanny Doss. She and Doss was too consumed with her mother's health to find out about Morton's affairs. Yeah, but then when she knocks off her mom, now it's fine to go back to her quote unquote took care of her mother and sister. She turned her full attention to her cheating husband, Mm -hmm. and he died under mysterious circumstances on May nineteenth of nineteen fifty five. Like I shouldn't laugh, but it's just like 
Wow. She's just knocking them off one at a time. Just, wow. Okay, so now we're at the no. fucking fifth husband. Fifth husband, <laughs> number five. So Nanny then married Samuel Doss, which obviously her name is now Nanny Doss, Doss. which is what she is famously known as. And you know, as. she went back to her hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> In June 1953, Doss was a Nazarene minister who had lost his family to a tornado in Madison County, Arkansas. Oh. So he was actually a good dude. Well, we think so. I mean, supposedly. So he highly disapproved of all romance novels and things that his wife basically enjoyed. He was just like, yeah, no. He was neither drunk nor abusive, but he simply made the mistake of telling his wife that she could only read magazines or watch television that were for educational purposes. And it's a like a sign of the time. He wasn't abusive or nasty or anything. He was a religious man. Like Yeah, he was. He wasn't abusive. He wasn't an alcoholic. He mm-hmm. just didn't agree with her smutty magazines yeah that that's all it was he wasn't super controlling or anything but this is where her downfall kind of starts to come into play so Mm -hmm. she made him a prune cake which was apparently like his favorite and she laced it with poison but samuel doss actually made it to the hospital yeah and he was there for about a month and the hospital diagnosed him with severe digestive tract infection yeah so he was there for a month and then he was released on released on october 5th so a few days later then he got home and a poison lace coffee finished him off and this is kind of what really finished her because he had been recently in the hospital he was working very closely with his, with a doctor and the doctor you know did his due diligence he there was no reason why he should have passed away right exactly so this is kind of where she makes a big mistake so he dies and the doctor who treats him is super suspicious and basically wants to do an autopsy which but i want to note this about autopsies back in the day you know it was you really didn't do tons of investigation into a death like if it was if it looked like natural causes then it was like eh, it's natural causes that's what it is yeah they didn't really notice poisonings a whole lot Yeah, so requesting an autopsy was strictly something only the family could do real realistically right and so he had to like kind of Manipulate her a little bit. But which actually worked perfectly. I mean, she vehemently was like, yes, go ahead and do an autopsy. This she, might prevent other people from she dying. She really, really, truly thought that she would not be able to get caught. Yeah. But the doctor found huge amounts of arsenic in Samuel's body, and he alerted the police. Yeah. Uh, during this time, little did the authorities know that Nanny was already talking to another dude that was, she was lining up to be her... Husband uh, number six. Husband number six. She even made him a pot. No, she made him a cake and sent it to him. So poor John Keel, who was a (laughs) six-year-old milkman in Coldsboro, North Carolina, he had been exchanging letters with Nanny for a while. Can you say dodged a motherfucking bullet? (laughs) Yeah, dodged a fucking bullet. He majorly dodged a bullet with this one. Uh, when the results of Sam Doss's autopsy came back, authorities had finally found um, enough evidence to go ahead and pursue arresting Nanny. And they also found uh, enough arsenic in his system to kill up to 10 people. And Nanny was just like, how did that happen? Oh, that's how, impossible. How did that get there? <laughs> how did that get there? <laughs> oh, but- so... She gets arrested in 1954. And they finally get her to confess. Not after she played dumb for her. Well, she did play dumb, but she finally did confess confess to murdering her husband. And she said that she had been looking for the perfect mate and the real romance in life. Doss confessed to killing four of her five ex-husbands, but not her mother, her sister, her grandson, or her mother-in-law, or anyone in her family, actually. Yeah, it wasn't until authorities exhumed some of Doss's previous victims and found large amounts of arsenic or rat poison in their bodies that 
you know, they figured out what the fuck was going on. And but, arsenic and rat poison were really common. Oh, very at the common. Time. I mean, so the easily accessible. Oh, all you had to do was go down to your drugstore and say, "I have a rat problem," and they would hand it right on over to you without, you know, no, no fuss at all. She's quoted as saying, "I never did feed that stuff to my blood, my blood kin." But the facts showed otherwise. Every, yeah, everybody just ironically died of uh, food poisoning. They actually went back and did belated autopsies for her mother and her sister, and both also had large amounts of arsenic in their systems. So police were amazed at the joy Nanny took in confessing to her crimes and reliving the details of, like, all of her husband's deaths. Like, she was way too cash about yeah and i think one thing that's really interesting is she actually laughed and giggled through the whole retelling of the events which what did you call that what, what, what? so this is kind of where i'm interested in wondering if when she had that accident when she was seven if she didn't have the pseudo bulbar effect and that is a psychological disorder where trauma can create a problem in the brain where your emotions are often erratic and you can have bouts of uncontrollable laughter or uncontrollable crying and so I almost wonder if she had this I mean obviously there's nothing that shows us Mm -hmm. that she did or that she didn't there's not enough um, research on her psychological state but you know because she was laughing through all of this I almost wonder if Mm-hmm. She had that? Yeah, I mean, it, or it could be a testament to her lack of compassion. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, when you have a severe head trauma like that, she did have a lack of empathy, mm-hmm. and having a head trauma like that could have those effects on her brain as well. Well, Nanny Doss pled guilty on May 17th, 1955, and was sentenced to life imprisonment because the state of uh, Alabama did not pursue, um, well, not Alabama, where did she live? The state that she lives wouldn't pursue the death penalty because she's a woman. Basically, having a vagina saved her ass. Yeah. And Doss was never charged with the deaths of her family members, just her husband. No, just her husband's. So she actually ended up dying from leukemia in 1965 while in prison. Yeah, so she was like 50 something, 60 something. So yeah, she, she been was like still 63. Relatively young woman. Yeah, well, I mean, she her first husband, she got married at 16. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah that's Nanny Doss. She. Wow. And you know, it's funny because there's actually a lot of quotes from her. Yeah, they like, did a lot of like interviews with her. One of the quotes, she's talking about her husband, and she's like, he sure did love those stewed prunes, though. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, there you go. That's- you bitch. <laughs> you absolute bitch. I mean, come on. We joke about murdering our husbands, but. Like, I'm not I, actually going to pull a nanny Doss on my husband. But you know what she would talk about as to, like, why she did it was how they annoyed her and yeah. ticked her off. When asked why she killed her husband, she responded. He was like getting on my last nerve. <laughs> she said that she didn't do it for the money. Like she said that the amount of money she received for some of the killings and stuff for, in the life insurance policies really didn't amount to all that much. It was more just they pissed her off or Homegirl has some uh some anger some issues. issues. <laughs> So let's talk about women serial killers. Yes, since this is our first female serial killer, let's talk about some of the facts. So like, I, I mean, serial killers do se- tend to share some of the same characteristics. Oh, absolutely. And there are going to be shared characteristics between men and female serial killers, but there are some distinct differences. Yeah. So female serial killers are mostly white and typically be kill between seven to ten victims like on average based on this research that was done on average they're usually middle class white women and they usually have a pretty decent head count of seven to ten people they're also more likely to murder family members than they are to murder strangers which is just well and i think that women murder murder family members because it's convenient Mm. They don't usually, like, stalk their prey like men do. So, of the surveyed serial killers in prison, what these researchers found that the most 
prevalent motive for murder was money and not money and revenge and not like lust thrill or no men notoriously kill for sexual gratification where women kill to gain something whether it be financial societal gains and they usually take a lot less risks so because of that and they're usually not the number one suspect their murder sprees last for decades yeah they normally um tend to operate for a substantially longer time than male serial killers and 80 percent of them know their victims yep and their most common means to kill is poison which is why i think they can go for so long without being unnoticed because when men kill it's messy they stab you they choke Mm -hmm. you they chop your body up into little bitty pieces and eat it those type of the the lust thrill killers the hedonistic killers for for women are very rare very Very rare. rare um so another really interesting thing about female serial killers is they're usually well educated mm-hmm. well nearly 40 percent work in health related fields as nurses or aides and about 22 percent work in direct caregiving roles so mothers or babysitters so we're talking 62 percent of caregiving positions bitches be crazy that's fucking crazy to me uh, most female serial killers were married at some point um, and they're usually serial monogamous like married on average once, twice, as many as even like seven times. Well, I mean, Nanny was working on number six when she got caught, so. (laughs) Nearly two-thirds of all the surveyed female serial killers from the study were related to their victims. Nearly one-third killed their significant others, and about 44% killed their own biological children. More than half the sample killed children, and about one-quarter killed those who were elderly or infirm. So basically, they kill people who are easy to kill, and aren't going to fight back, aren't going to question if they're being given coffee that tastes a little bit funny or given juice, they're more likely to drink it without asking questions. Um, According to some of this research that was done by Marissa Harrison, um, she's an associate professor of psychology and uh, at Penn State, she, I got this quote from her saying that first our data in line with other studies showed that female serial killers primarily kill for money. Previous research, such as Eric Hickey's, has shown that male serial, serial killers primarily kill for sex, which Chelsea talked about. But it's even showing up in this associate professor, professor's research. Like, And I mean, to build on that, Harrison was quoted as saying, research has shown that male serial killers tend to stalk and kill strangers, but female serial killers tend to kill people they know. It seems then that male serial killers are hunters and female serial killers are gatherers. Although apparent, this ev- this evinces the psyche operating much like conditions of our ancestral environment. I found that quote, like that quote from her was so fascinating to me. Right? Because women, it traditionally, not even traditionally speaking, like our history was men are hunters, women are gatherers. So all these women were like, Come, let me kill Even you. Even in serial killing, like, whether or not that's 100% proven fact, I mean, I, I know that's based on the research that her and her team did. Yeah. It still resonates, and I, it's fascinating. You know, every little bit of evidence that I, or not evidence, but research that I've read on female serial killers, it basically comes to the same conclusion. Mm-hmm. Women kill those who are close to them and for financial or socioeconomical gain. Mm-hmm. So sex is generally much further down the list on motivation for serial killers, which we've talked about. In fact, sex or sadistic motives are extremely rare among serial killers. If we go back to our conversations that we had about David Parker Ray and some of the research that we found there, it was talking about how childhood sexual abuse and trauma and Mm -hmm. introduction to pornography at a very young age can like create a hedonistic type of serial, not create, but can be something that's shared in common with hedonistic serial killers. The same thing goes for female serial killers that actually are introduced to like crazy sexual trauma and that kind of stuff, that the same kind of effect happens with them as well, Yeah, which I found interesting. So, and it says that because most female serial killers murder for money or other profit, some do it for attention and sympathy which they would get when someone that, you know, they're close with or have cared for dies. 
So if you think about that, like, you know, an elderly woman loses her husband, mm -hmm. your first instinct is to comfort them and to feel bad for them, mm -hmm. where she may have fucking murdered her husband. This reminds me, some years ago, there was a teenage boy who committed suicide that was egged on by his girlfriend. girlfriend and she essentially did it because she wanted him she wanted the attention that she would get from being his girlfriend right. since he passed she away she actually ended up um facing some charges to be culpable i guess yeah well although not a serial killer you can see the mentality exchange yeah. there it's, yeah man people are fucked up they really are and the last kind of little tidbit about female serial killers is they don't tend to travel around to do their killing they usually stay close to you know places that they know well so such as home or a healthcare facility or wherever they may work. There is it, the study in contrast between the female serial killers and their male counterparts is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. But I mean, hey, at least this one wasn't messy. <laughs> She kept it very clean with her arsenic like poisoning. The, this is the first one that we've had that I'm not, my stomach's not a little <sighs> afterwards. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I don't feel like... I actually don't necessarily feel like we need a palate cleanser, but I feel like we should at least do some memes. I was looking for some female killer jokes. All right. Palate cleanser, this is the palate cleanser. Gotta <laughs> love do you have memes? Meme, meme. <laughs> this one's good. What women look for in a guy. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Oh shit. What's his name? What's his name? Oh, Why is it Ramirez. Like okay, so it's a picture of Ramirez and it says, Loves Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Manson, family man. Ted Bundy, killer smile. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer, home cooked meals. <laughs> That's oh fucked up. Oh my god. I was craving Five Guys before it was a restaurant. Oh my god. That one's excellent. Yeah. When I started watching Forensic Files and I realized I've already seen the episode, I get mad. I get so mad I could poison someone in small amounts every day for six months. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Oh Christ on a bike. Well, y'all, I guess that's the end. I, this was one of our shorter episodes, but we had a two-week break. We needed to re-energize. Yes, we needed the break for Thanksgiving and to kind of enjoy our time with our families. We hope you enjoyed your time with your families or whoever you choose to spend your holidays with. And as usual, if you want to help support our podcast, the best way to do that is to leave a review and a rating wherever you listen to it. And you can also find us on social media at The Killer T on Facebook and Instagram. All right, y'all. Until next time. Join us next week to talk about H.H. H. Holmes. The Beast, the Beast of Chicago. Of Chicago. Chicago.